Hello and welcome to the inaugural Sheldon Bosley Night podcast. Uh, my name is Kate Gould and I am the content and media manager at Sheldon Bosley Night. I'm joined today by um, our two custodians, Dan Jackson and Mike Cleary. Welcome to you both. Um, before I start, I would like to say a big thank you to uh, One Mill Street for hosting us today in their fabulous studio. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, one Mill Street is in the heart of Leamington Spa, where we have one of our very many offices. And it's the most amazing space. You can hire out some of the rooms for networking meetings or just general chatting with colleagues. Uh, they've got a great cafe and this fantastic studio. So thank you very much uh, for hosting us today. So, Dan and Mike, um, I wanted to start by asking you about Sheldon Bosley Night, um, how it all began, how it's uh, started its rich heritage and history and how it's grown and evolved over the years um, and then I would like to maybe discuss uh, your own route into land and property and into the business itself and what it means to you. So Dan, um, tell me a bit about Sheldon Bosley Night and how it started. Thanks Kate. Um... It's an interesting uh, story, and it's 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 an ever you know an ever evolving story. I think actually, Kate, um, I've been in the business ten years now, um, and you know, undoubtedly in that period, it, it's experienced a lot of change. But um, as of last year, um, we're we're celebrating our hundred eightieth anniversary um, of of being in business of, of Sheldon Bosley through its various forms over the years. And um, certainly from my own experience, you hear all sorts of stories uh, from former partners and from uh, clients who've been involved throughout that period um, who have all really got their own story to tell about Sheldon Bosley and the evolution of the business. Um, we were particularly curious recently and... Uh, instructed a local firm of historians actually to try and delve a little bit deeper into this uh, for us and rooting through the archives and you know and really trying to piece together the various pieces of that jigsaw um, in, in establishing the origins and the background and, and the evolution of the business through the year through the years and that was an incredibly interesting exercise um you know big big um, shout out to James McIntosh um, uh, and his team uh, over there based in Chipping Norton who have spent countless hours trawling through archives, speaking to uh, various local stakeholders, former partners. And I know, Kate, you've been very involved as well mm. more recently in a lot of that work. So um, it, it's incredibly interesting. But I think the big thing that came out of that um, was really establishing a start date. And that's not easy either in its own right. But, but what has emerged and, and become clear is um was was it all really started with a chap called William Bull. So so William Bull in in the in the George Hotel um auctioning um furniture and um and chattels and more latterly guano, which was a bird feces that had come from the is it the Solomon Islands, I think? Itchibo Island. Itchibo mm. Island. And um and that was in in high demand at the time and uh, a very valuable commodity for farmers looking to increase their yields. And everything like that. So th that that business grew very quickly um, into something that looks a little bit more like Sheldon Bosley um, night of today. So um, uh, from there, um, started getting into livestock um, auctioneering, uh, and we still got a very proud um, heritage and associations to this day with with the livestock markets um, locally. Um, and then into property management, farm sales, and all that sort of thing. So that business, having kicked off in in eighteen sixty three, was eighteen forty three. Eighteen forty three. So that business, having kicked off in eighteen forty three, um, um, was taken on by William Bull and his um, his successors, uh, and then ultimately taken over by John Bosley at the turn of the twentieth century. Um, John being the father of Sheldon Bosley, um, who the, the business is, is named after to this day. So, uh, you know, we've we've got a, a fantastic document that, as I say, James McIntosh and his team have pulled together. It is um, fascinating reading. And as with um, all of these things, those stories come from the people that have been involved over the over the time. And 
as I say, we still act for the Bosley family um, to this day, as indeed uh, we do for, for a number of farmers um, and landowners whose fathers, grandfathers, great grandfathers were involved with the business back then. So, um, yeah, it's it's a very rich history. Mm-hmm. It's one that we're incredibly proud uh, to be associated with. And uh, you, you very kindly introduced us as, as custodians of the business at the outset of this podcast. And that is very much how we feel about it. It's um, been going a long time prior to, to our involvement. Um, and we, we hope we'll continue to do long, a long time after we're not here anymore. So, um, so, so that's you, it. you've outlined how we started sort of land yeah. um, base particularly. But in the years since, Mike, um, we've developed into much more than that. We, we're now very much a multidisciplinary business. So how did we evolve from purely land and auctions to kind of where we are today? Um, thanks, Kate. It's been a gradual evolution, if you think of William Ball back in the pub, listening to the farmers and what they might need. Um, obviously, housing has always been a constant requirement for land to build on, so he built a planning department out the back of that. Uh, that more recently has become strategic land as as farmers have sold parcels of land for 10, 20, 30 years ahead. Um, they've diversified um, having converted barns into other viable businesses. They've gone through um, planning process to create accommodation for farm workers which they've then rented out and Mm -hmm. sold off. So all of these things that now have nice names to uh, residential sales, lettings and stuff all came really from those farmers and their requirements. I suppose it's fair to say as well, Mike, that, you know, farm businesses are like any other business in that they've got to evolve over the, over Mm -hmm. time in terms of adapting to to the needs that, um, you know, and and the challenges that we faced and, you know, Farm diversification is an ever more uh, relevant topic. You know, nowadays we talk more about renewables and carbon offsetting. Back then, of course, you know, getting some bird fertilizer to increase your yields was the was the name of the game. So um, it's all the same challenges as any business, mm-hmm. um, but it's you know having to evolve and adapt to modern pressures, I suppose. Okay. But I think also it seems to me, having read the document from James McIntosh, that it's been quite an organic process it's kind of evolved more than being terribly strategic and um kind of corporate and i think that's kind of and also the family feel that comes through is still very much today i think we we all feel part of a quite a good community you know we all feel you know happy to be at work and to be sort of helping the people that we come across in our day-to-day lives both within the business and outside as well and I think you know you've been involved in quite a few acquisitions recently haven't you Mike so do you want to sort of talk us how that's kind of happened as well for the business? Yeah I I think Sheldon Bosley um, in its current legal form started the 1st of August 2016 so I just got involved with um, Oliver Knight from Knight and Rennie the autumn before Dan and Oliver played tennis over a game of tennis. There was an exchange that led to the belief that the two businesses together, Sheldon Bosley in Stratford and Shipston and Knight and Rennie in Kenilworth and Leamington that were, were just an estate agency letting agency would be better together Mm -hmm. to look after their clients. And so it, it took a bit of pulling together, but in August 16, we started and from there, really, we've just tried to always put the client at the centre of everything we do and do it to the very best of our ability. Um, we acquired a business in Evesham a couple of years later. Again, Dan's contact with Tony Rowland from TLG in Evesham ended up with us buying them. We got a very good team with that that enabled us to put proper footprints down and create what is currently the departments that we've got today so we've got very strong teams for commercial rural planning sales and lettings and i guess we sort of got on a roll Mm. um during lockdown we vowed to prosper we took hard decisions early on um we communicated with our staff whether they were at home or at work and we we came through very strongly and i think 
one of the things that occurred during lockdown was what we now know as We Are The Market, which was our own hyperlocal portal, which enabled us to really corral the local agents. We had 61 offices, 31 agents that we got to know very, very well. I think it's um, fair to say we were trusted um, in, in setting that up with them. And that gave us a, a, a much wider perspective on our location and what clients wanted and needed and that kicked us on um really mm -hmm. there were some very good brands in our neighborhood uh our current neighborhood not our original one like hawkins over in nuneaton and bedworth roy wanted to retire we went through a process we acquired that the sales agent then said i've got a business in leicester which is now new patch mike which he's a very good salesman so we bought mm -hmm. james Selleck and We've really gone on a roll from there, really, just picking up uh, very good quality lettings books for owners who are typically wanting to retire or take mm -hmm. a step through to retirement. Um, having bought seven businesses in 2011 and thinking that was probably it, we then went on to buy another six last year, culminating in our biggest yet, Andrew Granger, mm -hmm. which is a phenomenal business out in Leicestershire remarkably similar to the Sheldon Bosley where this all started a rural a planning a sales and lettings in three locations and mm -hmm. so we've sort of now got a bit of a reputation as a firm that is happy to acquire raise the standards and so we have a lot of owners coming to us now talking to us saying would you would you you know can I pass on my family business to your family business and, <laughs> yeah. and we think you'll look after them and and I think that's uh, it, Mike. Absolutely, is is I think a lot of that gets born out of you know you know we're not the we're not the only business in town, and and there are a lot of people doing very good work amongst our competitors and and everything else, and many of them we we consider friends. But I, I think that's been a big key to to the expansion is actually um, being able to hand on heart say to the principles of those businesses that we have acquired that actually you know they're in safe hands mm -hmm. we share a lot of the values um and you know and, and we'll continue to to build on the good work that they've done over many preceding years so um yeah it's absolutely there's a um there's a, a an organization where we're um, very proud members of the um central association for agricultural valuers who have got a, um, a sort of strap line motto that is that essentially says if you do the right thing come what may and that's something mm -hmm. that you know, we take very seriously and, and absolutely right. Know, yeah, so it's vital. Want, yeah. To, want to implement in everything that we do. Um, also, I should just mention that we've kind of come full circle because we reintroduced just over a year ago our auction department, yeah, of course. and of course that's doing phenomenally well. So it's lovely to see it come full circle in a way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it, it's something we've always done, uh, as I say, certainly from our heritage and, and um, you know, perhaps, I don't know if it fell out of favour in more recent years, but um, another big part of our ethos is that, you know, we will only do something if we can do it properly, resource it properly and mm -hmm. do it our own way. You know, there are, there are lots of online auction houses and different different methods that we've never Particularly had any great faith in but um but we 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 vowed to start doing auctions um uh what it would have been 2022 now um and we're very fortunate to fall upon matt burrows um who who has really led the march on that for us um driven that business which as you say kate has been incredibly successful in a very short period of time and i think i think it's something that is expected of us in as much as you know a, a, a firm at our heritage and, and background um, is expected to but it's all very well you've got to actually do these things and do them properly and i think that's really what's driven the success is, is the efforts of matt and his team um in providing such a great auction service which complements the other things that we do so well mm -hmm. um you know it's, it's another great string to our bow it's another great service offering for our clients it won't be for everyone but those that it is for um it, it suits incredibly well and there's a great um route to market and, and and route to disposing of property that perhaps wouldn't be as appropriate via other means so. yeah it is it is part of our dna that we do this i mean the auctions 
currently mm. getting the headlines because they've had such a good year. But actually, I'd probably take us back to We Are The Market with some other excellent agents. Uh, we then set up director's office because mm -hmm. we recognised that some calls weren't being picked up when we were busy. So we, we built a special team that, that picks up those calls now to enhance our service. We did auction. Um, last year, we set up a conveyancing business called Jefferson Legal and that helped 753 property transactions in 2023, its first mm -hmm. year. And uh, we're just quietly trialing the launch of Ernest Grant Mortgages, uh, our own mortgage business. So it's much easier to do things with total certainty that the client's mm. at the centre of it if we do it ourselves. And so we're constantly thinking, how can we deliver better and more to our clients? And those are actually five examples where we've sort of put our money where our mouth is and they're, they're all working very well. Well, yeah. mortgages will work very well. <laughs> So. so you both obviously got massive passion for the business, but how did you both get into land and property? Um, I, you both had different routes in. So, Dan, tell me how how it was for you. Yeah. So um, and then yeah. how also what SBK means to you, how you, you got into land and property and then the business and kind of why it's, SBK is important for you. Yeah. Well, it interesting Kate um I probably like many um teenagers didn't really know what what I wanted to do um I started embarking uh thinking I wanted to be an architect and, and taking classes in that respect to uh to do so and walked into the wrong talk one day at Manchester University um stumbled into a town planning lecture and thought well this is this is fantastic and four years later um qualified um with with a town town planning degree which um which which i used um it's interesting we have been giving a couple of talks in local schools recently which is quite a reflective exercise and and you it's possibly not until you reflect on on these sorts of things that that you really get an appreciation for how how these things have come together because it's it's been quite a journey but um so um yeah, as i say town planning degree from newcastle university um i then I had a bit of a period of, of traveling, did a lot of dairy farming over in New Zealand while I worked out what I wanted to do. Um, and then came back to the UK um, to work for a property business in Leamington for a, a small property developer, Greywell, a chap called Rupert Hopcraft, still a great mentor, friend to, to this day. And uh, learned an awful lot about the development process as a whole, really, which, which really sparked the interest from site finding, acquisitions, going through a planning process, building contracts, snagging paintwork, um, right through to sort of selling finished houses. And that was a, a, a fantastic exercise, you know, learning experience for me and sort of understanding how those various elements of the process um, came together. So, um, so yeah, three happy years with, with Rupert and Greywell. And um, I was then offered a job with Sheldon Bosley, 10 years ago now, Amy Field. Um, but um, <laughs> poor you, poor me. Um, so yeah, um, but back in 2014, um, joined Sheldon Bosley, um, over in Stratford as a junior town planner. Um, so, um, you know, going on from what we said earlier, really, um, helping farmers diversify, whether that's through barn conversions or new houses or, um, farm buildings and other you know various bits and pieces um so came into the business uh to do that and and that went particularly well we built that department up very quickly um and, and got a great reputation for that element of work um and then i suppose at the time um this was this was the sort of as i say 2014 15 sort of time when um the the planning process and the development process was really opening up a bit of legislation came in called the national planning policy framework uh, back in 2012 which opened the door for a lot more house building stratford prior to that had had a housing moratorium for the for the preceding 10 years and there'd not been a lot happening and what this legislation did was open the doors from that and and enable say a lot more large-scale house building so um 
Sheldon Bosley, by virtue of the rural connections, acting for the for the people with the green bits around towns and villages, suddenly started getting bombarded with letters from developers and land promoters, and um, and that was a, a brilliant process for me. It was the springboard for me personally to you know to get involved in some really exciting projects and and um, you know work my way through the business um, from that perspective. Um, and it's still something that I do to this day. You know, I'm still very active in terms of um, client liaison and, you know, I've, I still do that, look after our strategic team, strategic planning teams, um, and I'm planning an architecture department to this day who, are, as I say, have gone from strength to strength in that time. Um, and, and yeah, that's, that's sort of been it, really. It's been a bit of a whirlwind, obviously, with, um, you know, the expansion uh, more recently has been great mm-hmm. in terms of, offering new geographies to us and you know getting exposure to different types of clients and new patches but but the cause remained absolutely the same really okay i still get up every morning love what i do um and it's still the work that really drives that you know yeah. it's um you know it's, it's it's fantastic work i'm very lucky to be able to do it excellent mike what about you slightly different route slightly very, <laughs> very different route yeah um i also didn't know what i wanted to do post education i was uh, babysitting for a lloyd's bank manager who actually said what are you going to do mike and i said i haven't got a clue and he said well why don't you think about the bank it's a nice safe job pays well so in the absence of anything else i applied to jobs got accepted by midland bank um got offered a university scheme but they said actually why don't you go into a management training scheme which meant that I would earn money sooner. So I went uh, as one of four kids. I decided to go and get a job in the bank. Um, Loved the bank, dead man's shoes, worked there for 15 years, progressed very rapidly, but it was, wasn't was um, something that I had a true passion about. But on the way to work one day, which was an Eaton office, I actually saw a repossession on the Fozell Road in Coventry of a property and a very good mate of mine um, was always messing about with houses. So I bought it on my credit card for, I think it was £6,000. <laughs> and um, I think I think um, I learned a lot of lessons on property on that day. I think we worked out we made enough money for a skiing holiday. Um, no, no food or drink on the skiing holiday, but it was, <laughs> it was about £600 I think we made. But I've always had an absolute love of, Um, properties always fiddled with properties Um, but I think tellingly I was the manager within the bank probably from very early 20s I'm trying to work out whether I was 20 or 21 always manage people always love selling and getting the best out of people and supporting people and finding the best safest route to get things done and I think my my passion for people and managing, I, I can remember the two good managers I've had in my whole working life. Um, and so I've always been very keen to be a good manager, hopefully, and to mm-hmm. try and lead people fairly and stuff. And so it's come from that. So after 15 years in the bank, I went to work for a client who was earning £2 million a year as a financial services a guru in Coventry. I um, ended up running his businesses for him for six or seven years. I then consulted for a few years, still in the financial services industry as a director. Um, I was then very fortunate to have twin girls through a fairly unusual method. Kath had cancer when she was young, so we had all sorts of fun and games. So when they came along, I was actually working down in Canary Wharf. So I would put some money into a property strangely because i've constantly done uh, done that so i called my business partner at the time and said we've just bought somewhere haven't we yes it's in drake's broughton so i gave him my measurements and said right i'll be there tomorrow called kath and said i'm a builder so i became a builder overnight when the girls were six months old um, we ended up selling the family house to build three lovely stone cottages houses in in Napton. And during that time, Oliver had become a good friend. I'd end up 
mentoring him. I don't think he'd mind me saying that. He used to call me with his problems and challenges. And I think I actually let his very first house for him mm -hmm. because he refused to do lettings because it was boring and didn't pay very well. Uh, this was obviously before lettings became very valuable. Um, and so, yeah, I helped Oliver out. I think he came for a cup of, cup of coffee one day and I ended up helping him out before I'd agreed to formally join him because I was building some houses. Dan had had a game of tennis and the rest is sort of history. I built the houses, sold the houses, um, 10 offers on three houses, didn't go on the internet. So obviously um, <laughs> there's something going right here um, and bought into the business and the rest mm. is history really, I think. It's a chance for me having worked in some very big firms and some very poor firms to try and do things properly. I think a lot of staff can be um, not appreciated. I think there's a propensity for owners to take everything and not worry about the people mm. who actually make it work. And so I've always wanted to run my own business. I've always wanted to do things properly, to look after people, to try and make them wealthier than maybe they would be and and to do things properly and never to compromise. And so mm. we've Sheldon Bossy and I, very much Dan and I think the same on this. This is a this is a no compromise pay. We'll do this properly, do the right thing, come what may. We'll fund the right, we'll fund the business so that we can always do the right thing. And let's just try and be the best that we can and get better every day. And like Dan, I wake up some mornings praying it's light so we can get up and work. Mm -hmm. Every day is better than the previous day. Eight or nine years in, I can't remember now. So you mentioned being the best that we can be for the clients but also you're very keen on being the best for your staff as well and um i think it's testament to you both that you know the staff i would say generally love coming to work we love what we do we're passionate about it and you know passionate about also giving back to our communities in which we live and work and you know, Dan, I know you did, um, you've been involved in the Evesham 10K, you've, Mike, you did the Cotswold Walk, um, you know, Tasha in our planning department, she's done ab sales for Might and Hospice, you know, we're quite a, a team when it comes to giving back, aren't we? So, yeah, it's, it's so important, you know, we, we are so enshrined in the communities in which we live and work and, and you can't separate one without the other, um, really. And so it comes back to doing the right thing. As I say, mm. you, you know, we constantly want to give back. You know, we are proper community people. I think it's, mm. it's fair to say. So, yeah, you know, um, constantly trying to raise funds for, for various charities, um, you know, support good causes in the local community, sport in particular is very close to our hearts. I know, you know, I forget how many rugby clubs we sponsor these <laughs> days. But Five or six now, I think. Quite a lot. And, you know, I, you know, I, I live in a little um, village in North Cotswolds called Dumbleton, which is just a complete cricket mad um, village. And we're very proud to, you know, sit on the committee of that club. I've just got the planning permission for a new pitch. Um, financially, clearly, we want to support where we can, but it, but it's more than that. It, it's actually being involved day to day in in the running of those sorts of projects, and and as I say, trying to trying to build and and give back something to those communities who, frankly, have been so good to us. Um, it's, you know, in supporting us. Yeah, it's very true. Um, Natalie O'Sullivan, shout out to her in Persia, was approached by the Plum Festival. Now, I mm. I know of the Plum Festival because my mum lived in that area she had a mobile home there and she always used to go on about it so the the the, um, the organizers came in to the Pershaw office and spoke to Natalie and that called me and said what do you think and I said absolutely and what they were asking for wasn't really enough so we gave them a little bit more gave them a few ideas Natalie's committed hours in terms of helping make it work we did a we sponsored a coloring competition that they were trying to do for the schools um, we displayed the pictures in our windows and it's it's that sort of thing we'll always do as much as we can it's hard when you're growing a business and acquiring to have too much free cash around but we're very adamant that each of our offices get involved in the mm -hmm. community and, and do it with a smile on the face by the way we want mm -hmm. them we want all of our staff to love coming to work and love getting involved and and have the time to do it we created something called golden day that if a member of staff wants a day off 
to go and do something they can have it at our expense and uh yeah it's it's vital that we we play that role we yeah. we enjoy that role excellent and we've got a good track record of it i think you know there's so much going on you know emails constantly about can we do this can we do that and um you know how about um getting involved in you know the evesham 10k or um whether it's some other kind of uh, charitable endeavor i think we're all we're all very committed aren't we yeah so yeah, which is great we've got a bit of a wager this year yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. You really are going to make it. Yeah, but uh, no, Mark and I are both well highly competitive as well as uh, every, everything else. So we've got a bit of a wager on a on a is it half marathon this year yet to be determined. So, yeah, yeah. Determined, yeah. yeah. No, we'll, yeah. we'll live it. We'll live it and breathe it. And um, as I say, do it with a smile on our face. So, uh, yeah. so what does the future hold? Then we've talked a lot about our heritage, 181 years old now what what's the future hold is it is it going to look very different in 10 15 years time or you know for just the the sector in general and um the business in particular or is are we going to sort of just carry on and evolve naturally organically what do you think yeah it's an interesting question i mean if i don't know whether we could have predicted this four years ago that we would be where we are um, because we ne- never set out to do what we're doing, but I think we've we've sort of going there now. We've got more momentum than ever. Our scale gives us opportunities to launch new, um, uh, I nearly call them service lines, but new opportunities or new disciplines and stuff like mortgages. Um, I think we are now in Leicestershire in quite a reasonable way. So I think there's quite a few towns and villages that we'd quite like to fill. Um, so I guess we'll be doing that. Yeah, but. I think we 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 want to stay constantly agile, Kate. I think you know if mm. if if anything, if we've learned any lessons from from the last few years, it's that actually remaining fleet of foot and remaining open to you know to to to, to new service lines, to adapting to market forces is is absolutely something that you know we're able to do and as owner drivers of the business you know you know we don't have any great reporting um to do you know if it's the right thing to do we'll 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 get on and do it so no grand plan i I think it's fair to say mike that you know i'm not sure um you're going to be seeing an sbk london office anytime soon (laughs) or or anything to that effect you know it's you know we we want to continue to serve the communities we operate in and and Get, get constantly better at doing that really so yeah good point I, I mean the thing that keeps me awake at night is for a member of staff to go mike doesn't care or dan doesn't care so we don't want to get to the point where we can't sweat the small stuff that needs sweating mm. um because if my theory is if they know the small stuff's important to you then everything else will be i think with any business we're only as good as the people we have mm. and we have some outstanding people in, in, in every department, in every office, and, and finding those people and retaining them, retaining them relatively easy, touch wood, because they're good people and, and um, you know, we get on well with them. Mm-hmm. But I think we will grow as quickly as we have outstanding people alongside us. I mean, our mm-hmm. senior team now is is just brilliant, isn't it, with, with all the guys and girls, mainly girls, I have to say. They're, they're fantastic. We've been able to do an awful lot for the staff this year. We increased holidays up to 25 days for everybody. We've just um, uh, announced a whole series of additional benefits for people who've been with us for five years or more. Mm-hmm. We've actually just introduced some ex- additional bonuses for people two years or more. So we're constantly trying to create a perfect meritocracy with really good people and we can grow as fast as we've got good people, quite simply. So uh, come and join us. Yeah. <laughs> so the future's bright. Yeah. Always. Yeah. yeah. Always. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Excellent. Well, thank you, Dan, Mike, very much indeed. Thank you, Kate. Yes. Thank awesome. you very much. Yeah.